And everybody said, Amen. Welcome everyone to our workers' training tonight. And I pray that the word will have a new penetration and power in every life tonight in Jesus' name. I thought my people will say amen. amen. Father, we well, thank you for our workers' training tonight. Thank you for the faithfulness of your servants, your workers, and our leaders in the church. Thank you for the faithfulness at the headquarters and all over, in all the locations, all the states, and all the countries. We're asking, Lord, that your work will continue to prosper in every one of our hands in Jesus' name. We'll not be tired, we'll not be weary, will not fade in the middle of the way, but your strength and your power, your grace and your love, your compassion and passion within us will carry us through to the very end in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're coming to Matthew chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. In verse 44, it says, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. In verse 45, it says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Verse 46, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. Verse 47, and if ye salute, greet your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so the conclusion in verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. This final verse is a command coming from our Savior, coming from our Lord. He's talking to children of God. It says, your Father, which is in heaven. That means you have repented. That means you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has become your Savior and the Heavenly Father God has become your God and because of that he has this loving title your Father which is in heaven because you are saved and because you must take the nature of your Father and live like your father and act like your father and have the mind and the heart and the spirit and the attitude of your father be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect if you have gone beyond salvation you're sanctified is taking away the stony heart is so fruited the adamic nature is dealt with the depravity in your heart and the natural normal hatred for enemies in your heart he has taken that away and he has given you the heart of flesh and the spirit of christ he says now you deeply and doubly belong to God by salvation, by sanctification. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. The Father himself said, I will dwell in them. 
And when the Father dwells in you as a child of God, and Satan is not dwelling inside you, and is not controlling your life, is not leading, guiding your life, the Father dwells in you. And Jesus Christ said, we will make our abode in that believer. Christ lives in you. And then he said, the Spirit of God is with you and shall be in you. And so, if the triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit dwells within you, it will not allow you to harbor hatred and for hatred and animosity and anger and evil intention and evil attitude. It will not allow that to dwell inside you. At the same time, when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell in you. That's why it says, Be ye therefore, are you a child of God? Be ye therefore, are you saved? Be ye therefore, are you sanctified? Be ye therefore, do you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Be ye therefore, does the word of God abide in you? If he abide in me, and my word abides in you, if the word of God is abiding in you, be ye therefore perfect. You have the grace of God. Have you visited Calvary and has given you grace upon grace, grace over grace, and grace after grace? And are you living by faith? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father. Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Look at Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 40. In Luke chapter 6, verse 40, it says, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master and here the Christ himself he tells us what he means by perfection he says everyone that is perfect shall be as his master ye call me master and lord ye say well if then I have done this unto you you do the same to one another to be Christ like and to follow Christ and to live like Christ is to be the real follower disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and he says the disciple is not above his master but everyone, 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 everyone in every generation, everyone in every denomination, everyone in any local church, anyone, any year, any time, any way, in any country, any continent that says he believes in Christ and the work of grace has been done in the heart. He says everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. That's why tonight we're looking at the message, gracious living in the light of our father's perfection gracious living not in the light of man's imperfection in the light of you know the one who brought me to the gospel in the light of the way he lives not in the light of how brother so and so is living sister so and so is living we're living graciously we're living by the grace of god not by the because of the person in front of us because of our you know leader because of this because of that but in the light of our Father's perfection, living graciously. We're considering three points in the message tonight. Number one, we're looking at the character and the perfection of God. If we're going to be as perfect as He is, we must know how does He act? How does He think? How does he live? How does he relate with us? How does he deal with us? The character and the perfection of God. Number two, the command to be perfect and godly. It's not a suggestion. It's not an idea. It's not a plea. It's a command. It says, 
be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. The command to be perfect and godly. Number three, our consecration. If he has said so, number one, we desire that. He wants that. That's what pleases him. And that is what he's looking for in your life, in my life, in your family, in my family, in your community, in my community. If that is what he wants, I desire that. I devote my life to that. You dedicate your life to that. And you want to have the deeds of perfection. There are only a few hours during the day. The rest of the day we're sleeping. Those few hours we are awake when you are in control of your thought, in control of your mind, in control of your action. You want to desire what Christ himself has demanded. Number three, our consecration to be perfect in goodness. That's how it reflects its uh, perfection. It gives sunshine to the just, to the unjust, to the sinner and to the saints. It gives rain to the just and to the unjust, to those who are living right and who are not living right. It's his goodness, his mercy, his compassion, his action to the children of men that make us to know that this is a perfect God and will follow after that that goodness to our consecration to be perfect in goodness. Number one is the character and the perfection of God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 48, be ye therefore perfect. Don't throw the command to another person behind you over your shoulder. He's looking at you and he's saying, a child of the Father, aren't you? You're a worker in the vineyard, aren't you? Here is my command for you to take back home. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. The character and perfection of God. Three things. Number one, number one, we're looking at uh, the comprehension of God's perfection, the understanding of God's perfection. We look at the perfection of God and we think through. We don't just read it and say, okay, I know God is perfect. Comprehension, understanding of God's perfection. Number two, the constancy of his glorious perfection. His perfection is glorious. It's shown in heaven, it's shown in earth. And we want to have, we want to see the consistency and the constancy of that perfection of God, which is glorious. Number three, the compassion of his gracious perfection. Because of that perfection, he shows mercy. You cannot say you are perfect and you are not merciful. Because of that uh, perfection, he shows compassion on people. He thinks of people and he helps people and he holds people up and he shows them the loving kindness that a perfect God will show. Number one, the comprehension of God's perfection. Deuteronomy chapter 32, reading from verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment and a God of truth and without iniquity just and right is he. That's his perfection. We're looking at Job chapter 36, reading from verse 4. It says, For truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. He who can we refer to that is really perfect in knowledge is knowledge about the past. Is knowledge about the present. Is knowledge about the future. He is perfect in knowledge. Is knowledge about you. Is knowledge about your action. Is knowledge about your thoughts. Is knowledge about your future. He that is perfect in knowledge. Is knowledge about 
every plan, every thought, everything behind the action of anyone. His knowledge is perfect. And that one whose knowledge is perfect he is with you. The comprehension of God's perfection. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it tells us, Behold, he is mighty perfectly mighty and despises not any because he is perfect he is impartial his imperfection is also reflected in his impartiality he is perfect in strength and wisdom psalm 18 look at verse 30 in psalm 18 verse 30 as for god his way is perfect you cannot find any error, any falsehood, any iniquity in his ways. You cannot say, I want to modify this because I want to perfect it. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Verse 32. In verse 32, it says, it is God that Guardeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. Look at that. His way is perfect. And then I come to him and I say, oh Lord, you know, I'm a sinner. I'm imperfect. I have transgression. He says, hold on. He forgives. He sets you free. He turns your life around. And he removes every iniquity, every transgression. And he removes also the imperfection. And now you can say, God guts me. God surrounds me and he strengthens me and he maketh my way perfect. James chapter 1, reading from verse 17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The comprehension, the understanding of God's perfection. Look at number two. Number two is the constancy, the consistency, the continuity of his glorious perfection. His perfection is a glorious perfection. It is not something that does evil, that thinks evil, that plans evil, that plots evil against any part of his creation. It's a glorious perfection. And that glorious perfection is constant, continuous, consistent. In Second Samuel chapter 22, reading from verse 31, as for God is way is perfect if you see any imperfection in the world you cannot attribute that to god if you see any imperfection in any man any woman you cannot say well that's the will of god that's how god has made it if you see any imperfection in any area of the universe you cannot say that's the work of god no as for god as for god God, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried, and he is a buckler to all them that trust in him. That's why the angels cry in Isaiah chapter 6, reading from verse 3. That's why the one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You cannot go beyond that. They say in all his action and in all his uh, utterances, in all his dealings, in everything he does with angels and with men, in heaven and on earth, everywhere and every time is holy, holy, and holy. And he says, that's the Lord, that's his nature, that's his character, that's his strength, that is his attitude, that is his dealing. The whole earth is full of his glory. Exodus chapter 15, reading from verse 11. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, who is like like thee, 
glorious in holiness, glorious in holiness, glorious in perfection, and fearful in praises, doing wonders. Revelation chapter 4, reading from verse 8. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, and the four beasts are each arch uh, of, uh, of them, six wings, about him. And they were, they were full of eyes within and uh, they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And then in verse 9, it says, And when those living creatures, that's what it means, that one it says the beast, it means the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him that such on the throne who liveth forever and ever. In verse 10, it says, and the four and twenty elders representing the church fall down before him that such on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying then in verse 11 it says thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are our created. We're looking at number three. <clears throat> number three, it says, the compassion of his gracious perfection. The compassion of his gracious perfection. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, that he may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good. All the all humanity. Some are good, some are bad, some are saved, some are not saved. But he makes his son to rise and to shine on the evil and the good. Isn't that compassion? Look at the rest, the rest of the verse. And he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. There are some natural things that human beings need, that natural people need. They need sunshine. We all need the rain and the water. And the Lord grants that uniformly. Every city. Every local government, every community, every country, every continent, all over the world, the rain and the sunshine. Why? Because it's merciful. Because it's compassionate. It tells us in verse 46, it says in verse 46, For if ye love them which love you and no more, what reward of you? Do not even the publicans the same, 47. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans, the sinners, the unsaved, the unjust, the ungodly, do they do that? If you only do what unbelievers do to their friends, if you only do what sinners do to those who give them something, who make them happy, if that's all you do, what is the evidence of grace in your life? The evidence of salvation in your life? The evidence of being a child of God? They are children of disobedience. They are sinners. And you're not doing more than they're doing. Then you're like them. They are children of wrath, they are sinners, and you are not doing more than they are doing, then you are the same level. They are graceless and godless, and you are not doing beyond them. All your talk of salvation is but the word of mouth. You are as graceless as they are. That's why Jesus said, if you salute your brethren only, 
what do ye more than others do not even the publican so and now he brings in verse 48 and he says be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect psalm 145 in psalm 145 reading from verse 8 the lord is gracious and is full of compassion slow to anger and of great mercy if you are quick to to anger that is any little sin you wear your temper temperament on your skin and anybody can easily provoke you a little thing a little feather as light as a feather can provoke you you get angry look at god the lord is gracious full of compassion are you empty of compassion how will you say you are like god how will you say you are as perfect as your father who is in heaven always fighting quarreling with your wife at home always picking something on your husband at home nagging 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 every time and you are angry every time and there's no compassion there's no mercy you don't even allow to give some allowance maybe that is said she's thinking that way he's thinking that way maybe you don't even think and make any excuse for anybody and he says we should be perfect and compassionate as a father who is in heaven and sometimes when people are angry they don't talk they just seal up and they just get angry and they are ruminating and they are thinking angry thoughts in their mind god doesn't do that and jesus is saying every moment of the day every hour of the day be compassionately perfect the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He's slow to anger and is of great, great mercy. Look at verse 9. And the Lord is good to all. The Lord is good to all. That's his perfection. That's the mercy. That's the love. That's the compassion in his perfection. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works and then he tells us in micah micah chapter 7 reading from verse 19 he will turn again he will have compassion upon us he will subdue our iniquities and he will cast them he'll cast all their sins in the depths of the sea have you done that those who have sinned against you and those who have offended you one way or the other are you carrying their offense on your face you're reaching it in a book you're reaching it on the pad and you're reading it every time if you're going to be as compassionate as god you will cast all those iniquities all those sins all those faults in the depths of the sea where you cannot see them anymore that's what Jesus is saying is saying the perfection of God shows in his compassion and your being perfect as God is perfect will show in your compassion he will turn again he will have compassion upon us he will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea in verse 20 he tells us thou will perform the truth to Jacob. That's perfection. When you know the truth and you perform the truth. You don't only declare the truth, proclaim the truth. You do it actually. And you perform the truth. You know the truth, what to do to that sister, what to do to that brother. The real truth, the gracious truth that will lift their lives up. If you are following the commandments of the Lord, be ye therefore perfect as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. You will demonstrate the deed of truth unto your name and it says and the mercy to Abraham which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the 
days of old. It tells us in Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 31. Here is uh, what he's talking about, the mercy and the compassion of God. And he's saying, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, uh, is perfect. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 31. And as he would, that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Do you ever think in this situation, what do I want my neighbor to do unto me? The perfection is do that to them. How do I want them to love me, to appreciate me, to help me, to support me, to encourage me, to lift me up? Do exactly the same unto them. But if you are thoughtless, and what you wouldn't want anybody to say to you, to do to you, to act to you. That's what you do to your neighbor. You, are not, you don't even desire the perfection. But he wants you to have, he wants you to manifest the perfection. And he says, as she would, that men should do to you, do ye even so to them likewise. Verse 32, in verse 32, it says, For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those who love them. Verse 33, in verse 33, And if ye do good to them, we do good to you. What thank have ye for sinners? They've never visited Calvary. They're not saved. They're not born again. Sinners also do even the same. Verse 34, in verse 34, And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye for sinners also lend to sinners? To receive as much again. Verse 35. But love ye your enemies. And do good. And lend. Hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the thankful and to the evil. The conclusion in verse 36, be ye therefore merciful. This is a parallel verse to the one in Matthew. In Matthew, be ye therefore perfect. In Luke, be ye therefore merciful. Bring the two together, be merciful to show, to reflect your perfection like the perfection of God. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. We're coming to point number two here. Number two, we're looking at the command to be perfect and godly. Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In everything you do, be very thoughtful. Don't rush into any action. There's nothing wrong. It's in hold on. Give me some time to think through about this. Do not just uh, impetuously act. There's nothing wrong in saying, I don't know what to do now. Let me pray about it. And then, as you pray, and you pray according to the scriptures, Lord, would you give me grace to do what you called me to do? The people are just always jumping to conclusion, always jumping to action. They jump and they leap before they think. But think on the scriptures. See what the Lord has said. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Father, what would you do to this situation, to this person? Help me, Lord, to do the same thing. Christ, a perfect Savior, 
what will you do at this time at this crossroad in this situation grant me the grace to do the same spirit divine in what direction will you lead me at this time are you always walking and always acting and always speaking and always moving always going up going down always doing today what you did yesterday why don't you slow down and think lord what should i do christ remind me what i should do and i will follow in your steps and i'll say be ye therefore perfect even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the clear, changeless precept demanding a perfect heart. Number two, Christ's complete provision for our perfect holiness. Number three, constant, conscientious preparedness for a perfect heaven. Number one, the clear, changeless precept demanding a perfect heart. In Genesis chapter 17 verse 1, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Lord God, the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. We human beings have a peculiar problem, a peculiar challenge. Once we've gotten into the experience of salvation four years ago, we don't think there's anything to hear, anything to learn again. Abraham had known the Lord at the age of 75, at 99, 24 years after. This message, a new message for a new life, for a new direction, for a new attitude, for a new heart, came to him the challenge is you've been in the church for 24 years for 20 years for 34 years and now the message comes you hear but you don't think about it and you don't plan on it because you've known the lord all those many years and yet the lord is saying now if you had already got it i would not be talking about it 24 years since the Lord, you have not got it. Get it now. Walk before me and be thou perfect. May the Lord do it in every life in Jesus' name. For Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I've refused him. Why? For God seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. It doesn't only really look at our action. It will be a correct action, but the heart is not perfect. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 25 verse 2 look at this man and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord but not with a perfect heart somebody can have good action good outward expression good external performance but the heart is what matters to God. And the Lord is looking at the action that comes out from a perfect heart. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 8, Blessed are the pure, the perfect in heart, for they shall see God. The heart, the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. 
for they shall see God. Have you ever come into the situation where you are thinking something different and you are doing something not different? Why? Because our hands, our body has what we call reflex action. You've done that thing hundreds of times. And because you've done it over and over and over, you know how to do it. And there's no mistake. And it's all right. Because you are used to that habitually. And at the same time, you're thinking bad in the heart. Thinking evil in the heart. Erroneous thinking. And that's what God is looking at. It's not the one you are doing habitually that the hands will perform, the feet will perform, the mouth will perform, but the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's what Jesus said in verse 20. In verse 20, he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, the outward external righteousness, except your righteousness shall go beyond shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. He shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, that is serious. That is not just looking at outward expression of righteousness, it's looking at the heart. And at whatever we do, if the heart is corrupt, if the heart is polluted, if the heart is maligning, mischievous, the heart is having iniquity, is full of rottenness. And yet the outward expression, like the actions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the outward expressions are all right, but the heart is not all right. It says such a person will not enter into the kingdom of God. Heaven. And that's why it says in verse 48, it says, Be ye therefore perfect in heart, and then as the heart is so, will the action be. Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Look at number two. Number two here, Christ's complete provision for our perfect Holiness. The holiness it demands, holiness of heart, holiness of spirit, holiness in our mind, holiness in our thought, holiness in our inward personality is provided for that already. And all we need to do is go to him, lay everything on the altar, consecrate unto him and tell him, Lord, I know you provided for this, do it for me. He will do it for us. I said he will do it for us. He came so he can take us from earth to heaven. And he knows that without this inner perfection, inner holiness, inner purity, we cannot get to heaven. And he wants us to get to heaven. He's made the adequate provision, but must come to him and ask him. We're looking at Le Leviticus chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 7. Leviticus chapter 20, reading from verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore... And be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. I am your God, you are saved. I am your God, you are in the kingdom. But you need to go further so that your heart is purified and made holy and sanctified. Because I am the Lord your God. In verse 8, in verse 8 it says, And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. He'll do it. He'll do it for everyone in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 74. In Luke chapter 1, verse 74, it says that he would grant unto us 
he will grant unto me. He will grant unto me. You appear tired. He will grant unto me. That's good. It's good to be excited when you think of what God will grant unto you. It says that he would grant unto us that being delivered out of the hands of our enemies. Don't worry about them. He has delivered you already in Jesus' name. Might serve him without fear. Somebody shout, serve him without fear. You know, when you fear people more than you fear God, you will serve the person you fear most. If you fear a man, a woman, in society, at the place of work, anywhere, anyone you fear above any other, the one you serve most. The one you fear most is the one you remember is threat, his problem, and the possibility of what he can do. You fear him more than God, you're going to forget God because you don't fear God as much as you fear him. The person you fear most is the one you will serve. And so if you're going to serve God, God without the fear of man. You must bring God above all men, above all women, and understand whatever man can do, he can only do it against you here on earth for a short period of time. But the God of all eternity, who has the ability to kill, to destroy, and to throw into hell forever and ever, Jesus said, fear him, but he will deliver me from all fear. Say it, say it, and let heaven hear you, that he will grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Look at verse 75. In holiness and righteousness, he will do it. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now, think about this. You know God, you are saved. You know God, you are sanctified. What if you don't fear any man? What they can take from you? What they can do to you? What they can harass you with? What they can punish you with? What pressure, punishment, persecution they can bring on you? How they can do whatever the depths of human depravity can do. What if you don't fear that? You will serve God freely. The reason why people do not have holiness of heart is because they fear Mr. So-and-so. They fear Madam So-and-so. They fear the powers that be. And because of that fear, they don't have really the liberty to express their worship unto God and to worship God without fear and without any trembling. But when God cuts off that fear from your heart, you will love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You're not thinking of any other person on earth. The only thing you're thinking about is, how can I please God in all that I do, in all that I say, in all that I think? Then you will serve him in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of your life you will do in jesus name anytime you're about to do something and that's according to the will of god and all of a sudden something checks you and uh, don't do that ask yourself why it's like you are afraid of so and so you're afraid of such and such and that fear is going to cut you away from God 
I might eventually cut you away from heaven. Holiness will be your heart and your lifestyle in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 15. First Peter chapter 1 verse 15. But a sea which has called you is holy, is holy, is holy. At the time Peter wrote, God holy. The time before Peter wrote, God holy. At this time after Peter wrote, thousands of years now, God is still holy. Every time God is holy. And he says, I see, which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Verse 16. In verse 16 it says, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And then in verse 18, verse 18 tells us, for as much as she know that she was not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's the price of our redemption. And in Second, in Second Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 1, having there for these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, all shapes and sizes of filthiness, internal filthiness in our thought, internal thinking of filthiness in our mind, external corruption and filthiness all around. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Number three here. Number three is constant conscientious preparedness, readiness for a perfect heaven. The place we're going to heaven is holy and it will not admit anyone that is unholy. Anyone that dies in unrighteousness and ungodliness. And we don't know when Christ will call us home. We don't know when Christ will come to get into that perfect heaven. We must be ready. We must be prepared. In Psalm 24, reading from verse 3, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Here is the answer in verse 4. He that has clean hands, clean hands, he doesn't have Another man's property held in his hand, he has made his restitution. He doesn't have another man's wife in his heart, in his thoughts, in his intimate relationship. He doesn't have any pleasure. He's deriving from another man's, another woman's husband. She's released them. He has released them. And his hand is clean. Abimelech said, Lord, I have not touched her. And God said, yet I know you have not touched her. I prevented you from touching her. He, she is another man's wife. Restore her. If you don't, you'll die. When you die, you are separated from God forever and ever. And Abimelech rose early in the morning and called his servants and called Abraham. And to cut a long story short, gave Sarah back to Abraham. We must release what belongs to other people, the wife that belongs to other people. Don't you ever allow another woman to have more 
interest in you, more discussion with you than she has with her husband. Don't take their attention. Don't take their love from their husband. And the same thing, don't take their love from their wife. Release them. That's how you can have clean hands and any property money or any other thing belonging to other people you are holding if you want to get to heaven if all you want is to just come to church and go out to be called brother so and so sister so and so if all, that's all you want without getting to heaven that's okay for you but if you're going to get to heaven the readiness and the preparedness he that has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Hebrews 13 verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate in verse 13 it says let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp outside the camp bearing his reproach persecution they are called your names holy holy they are called your names perfection they are called your name, brother perfect, sister perfect. You must bear that reproach. If you cannot bear that reproach, how are you going to be ready for heaven? Let us go forth, therefore, unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. In verse 14, it says, For here have we no continuous city, but we seek one to come. It tells us in uh, Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19. We're reading from verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Whatever is happening around you, don't be gloomy, don't be sad, don't look at physical things, what you have lost or what you have gained. Don't look at, you know, I wish I had that, I wish I had that. But it says, be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. I pray you'll be ready. I said, I pray you'll be ready. And we should be ready at every time, every moment, every day. We should be ready. Because in verse 8, it says in verse 8, For to unto her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen, that fine linen that will wear on the inner man, on the spiritual man, that clean linen that will wear on the one, the soul, the spirit that will go to heaven, that fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not the righteousness of the Sadducees, of the Pharisees, of the Sanhedrin, of the religious people, external, is the righteousness, inner righteousness of the saints. We're coming to point number three. Point number three is our consecration to be perfect in doing good. Perfect in doing good. Perfect in goodness as his goodness. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, Verse 43, ye have heard that it had been said, hold on, he didn't say ye have read, because you cannot reach that in the scriptures, to love and then to hate. Ye have heard in the interpretation of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, and if you followed their interpretation, you will not please God. This is what they have said. This is their 
oral command, not the reaching command of God. Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Verse 44, it says in verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Now you are born again, switch over from the living of the Pharisees to the truth of Christ. And the truth of Christ is love your enemies. Who do you count as your enemy? shouldn't be a real child of God, a child of God, another child of God, we're brothers and sisters. He's not your enemy. But even if you count anybody as your enemy, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Don't do teeth for touch, tooth for tooth. And don't say, he threw that at me, I'll throw that back. That's what sinners do. But if you're a child of God, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You understand? Despitefully use you. Like you use somebody, you don't have their good in mind, you only have your own goal at mind, your own progress at mind, your own peak of the mountain at mind, and you use them without paying them back for their services. You use them like slaves, like people that don't have anybody to answer or talk for them, and they cannot talk for themselves. You use them. And Jesus said, even if somebody took you for a slave and used you despitefully and persecutes you, he says, pray for them, love them. That's not the uh, kind of perfection is calling us to that in the short time we have to spend here on earth, we are as merciful and we're doing good and the Lord himself is good, doing good. It says in verse 45, it says that ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sent the rain on the just and the unjust. Verse 48. In verse 48, it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, as your father, as your father. The people of the world, they have their own father. Jesus said, Your father is the devil. And the works of the devil you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. Because he's a liar and the father of lies. And so when the people of the world behave like their father, you. If you are not of the world, if you are saved, if you are born again, if you are on your way to heaven, you will act like your father who is in heaven will act. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. Three things here. Number one, believers, consecration, and prayer for perfection. Number two, becoming Christ-like in the practice of perfection. Number three, better commendation and praise for the perfect. Look at number one. Number one, believers, consecration and prayer for perfection. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. In Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, he prefers to his one of you. If a servant of Christ saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that she may stand perfect. A pastor wishing 
desiring, praying that the members will stand perfect. And what you pray for is what you preach. It's what you proclaim. It's what you tell the people. This is my desire for you. This is my prayer for you. This is my passion for you. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. Colossians 1 28. We will preach and warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That was the uh, heart, the passion, and the desire of the apostles to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And that's what they prayed for in First Thessalonians chapter 5, Verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Amen. In chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, night and day praying, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Number two, number two, becoming Christ like in the practice of perfection. Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 14. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Never an angry word Never an hateful thought, never an injurious action, never an evil plan against anybody. That's our master, that's our Lord, and he went about doing good in his perfection. And he expects the same thing from us if we are to be like him. It says, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 3. In First John chapter 3, verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as, even as, even as he is pure. Verse 16, it tells us, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's the perfection. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down Whatever it is, we need to lay down for the good, for the progress, for the joy, for the happiness, and for the progress of our fellow brothers and sisters. Chapter 4, reading from verse 17. In chapter 4, reading from verse 17, it says, Herein is our love made perfect. Not imperfect love, not unstable love, not superficial love, not a kind of love that is only superficial on the word of mouth. It's coming from the heart. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world? And then in verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love. If there is fear between you and I, there's no love, there's no perfection. If there is fear between the man and his wife, between the woman and her husband, 
I shall be careful what I say. She is uh, quickly angry. I shall be careful where I put this, where I put that. He is um, impatiently and passionately angry. And I must be careful. I mustn't uh, kind of provoke uh, that lion inside to come out. There's no love there. If there is love, look at what it says. There is no fear in love. In the church, if there is love, there's no fear in love. In the marriage committee, I'm praying and I have to fast before I go to the marriage committee because I don't know what I will meet here. It looks like I don't think they love me because their action and the way they are ready for me, what is the love? If there is love in our midst, there is no fear. If you are going to a place and all the people there are our members and then you are sent there to go and declare a message to them and you are afraid, I must be careful. God give me wisdom. How do I put this now? What direction do I go? And I'm afraid what they might do. There's no perfect love there. Those people we're afraid of, either we who are fearing them or they who we fear are not ready for heaven yet. You know heaven, heaven is full of love. And if we're relating together here, and all we can think about is fear. I fear him, I fear her, I fear them. We're not a people ready and prepared for heaven. It says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment. Leadership, in our leadership, in your leadership, Whoever you are, anywhere you are, if you are, you know, so your leadership is, you know, to generate fear in the hearts of the people. And they say, yes, sir, yes, sir. And they become slaves. They are not really sons and daughters in the ministry, in the church. They are slaves. If I don't do that, they'll do it. If I don't do that, they'll do this. And we're acting in fear, in fellowship, and in leadership. There's no heaven in front of that person. When there is a love in leadership, why not? If we say yes, sir, we say it out of sincerity, not out of fear. If we bow, we say it out of love, out of sincerity, not because of fear. And if somebody, you know, needs my attention, if I give him attention, it's not because I'm afraid of him. If I don't give him attention, he'll do this. There's no, there's no service in that. If we give attention at all, we do it because of love. And we do it because of perfection. Not because if I don't, then they will do this. If that's all we're saying, we're not serving God, we're serving man. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. I pray the Lord will perfect our love for each other and for God in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three here, better commendation and praise for the perfect. Our commendation coming from God. The appreciation coming from God. The, the reward coming from God. It's a, and that's a better commendation. Better than what any man can give unto us. Look at this commendation of God concerning Job. It tells us in Job chapter 1, reading from verse 8, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? That's the testimony of God concerning Job a perfect and an upright man one that feareth God and because of his fear for God he is choice evil he hates evil he shuns evil he kind of detests evil and he will not have anything to do with any form of evil and God himself bore witness concerning him 
a perfect man. Chapter 2, reading from verse 3. In chapter 2, reading from verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, my servant, my servant, he belongs to me, and he has the grace of God in his life. I know him like he knows me, and I declare even before Satan, and before the angels and before anyone who oh, will hear that this Job, he has commendation, recommendation from me that he is perfect. And the Lord said unto Satan, as thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is choice evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. That's a perfect man. A person that, you know, the wind is blowing against his face, and the boils ravaging his body, and his friends accusing him. And he couldn't even understand, he couldn't see the way he was following. And he said, I look for him this way, that way I can't find him. And yet, holding on to his integrity without any encouragement from anywhere. And it says, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Look at chapter 37, verse 37 of the Psalms. In Psalm 37, reading from verse 37, mark the perfect man. Now, if there was no perfect man, we we'll say, God, we can't mark anyone. We can't spotlight anyone. We can't see anyone. We can't identify any man. Since there's no perfect man, it means God knows there are perfect men made perfect by grace, perfected by his goodness, perfected by his mercy. And now the scripture by the Spirit calls us, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. I pray your end will be peace in Jesus' name. You will align your life according to the perfection of the Lord. You will arrange your life. You will make your life to go in the direction of the perfect word of God. And then the Lord can say, look at him, mark that man, mark that woman. For the end of that man, that woman is peace. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3, verse 15. Philippians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 15. It says, let us therefore as many as be perfect, perfected by grace, perfected by the experience of sanctification, perfected by the holy recreative hand of God. It says, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in any sin ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In verse 16, it says, nevertheless, where to we? have already attained salvation, sanctification, holiness of heart, power. After we've got the purity of heart, it says, wherefore, whereunto we have attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Verse 17, and then it says, brethren, be followers together of me. And mark 
them which walk so as she have us for an example in verse 20 it says as we keep on walking like that perfected by grace purified for godliness empowered by the spirit it says our conversation a lifestyle a conduct a character is in heaven for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the savior the lord jesus christ verse 21 who shall change our vile body if he's able to change a vile body if he's able to make the dead physically dead to rise again from their graves if he's able to raise the millions of believers in christ who have died all these many years and raise them up and catch us who are alive and take us to heaven alive if he's able to do that he can sanctify us he can purify us he can purify and perfect our heart it shall change a vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the walking whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself our Christ is able our Redeemer is able our sanctifier is able, a purifier, the perfecter of our faith and the perfecter of our heart, of our life. He is able. He will do it in our lives. He will do it in your life. He will do it in my life. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We we'll see what commandment the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, has given today. If you love Him, if you love His Word, if you accept Him, if you accept His Word, you'll be excited about this. Look at what my Lord has said and look at what Christ, the Christ of heaven, Christ my Savior, Christ my sanctifier, Christ my purifier, Christ, what He has said. Be ye therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect look at what god has said and open your mouth and talk to the lord and say lord thank you i know it is possible that's why you said it and i want i desire i am ready i am prepared for that perfection please open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer god do as you have said. Christ, I know you have provided for this, for my holiness, my sanctification, my readiness for heaven. And I know the call to heaven can come anytime. And Lord, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Stretch yourself spiritually on his altar. And whatever imperfection is there, whatever faults are there, whatever infirmities are there, whatever spots are there, whatever wrinkles of the marks of the Adamic nature, the old man, whatever marks of the Adamic nature are there, tell the Lord, O oh Lord, for heaven's sake, you can do this for me. For being ready, for your call you can do this for me i pray that my perfection will not be a pretending perfection i pray lord you do this for me and you'll be satisfied you've cleansed me purged me purified me sanctified me perfected me tell the lord is that imperfection in your heart your attitude, your disposition, your actions, your relationship to others, your drive from within. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord. You'll be happy you prayed for this. When God himself marks you out. Remember? Outward activity may be good. 
if it doesn't come from a perfect heart, a purified heart, a holy heart, it's not acceptable to God. Remember, work, work, work. If it doesn't have the heart behind that of holiness, of grace, graciousness, all that work, 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 will not be recognized by God. Man looks the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And Messiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Solomon manifested great, great wisdom, but his heart ultimately, eventually, was not perfect towards God. Heart without fear, without the fear of man, without the fear of a woman. Something you do all to God, not because you're afraid of man more than your love for God. Tell the Lord, pray from your heart, and if you do, God answers prayer. Anyone you fear above God is the one you are worshipping. And they cannot make a way for you in heaven. The man you fear, the woman you fear. Only God who knows your heart saved, sanctified, holy, faithful to God, only God can admit you to heaven. On the basis you have clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands, Clean hands, clean hands, and a pure heart, righteous heart, purified heart, cleansed heart, a heart yielded, devoted to the Lord. Trusting God fully, completely, and no rival. There's nobody, no man, no woman on earth rivals the love of God in your heart. In the secret and the public, the private the corner of your heart, your relationship with people, your fully, completely, or reservedly dedicated to loving God. And your drive, your desire, your passion that you love Him, love God above anything anyone on earth.
You're always looking at the character of God. You're following after that character. You're doing everything to please the Lord, like Enoch. Not to please yourself. Not to please society. Not to please anyone in here, out there. Serving God without fear. In holiness, righteousness, before God, all the days of your life, conscientious, committed, purposeful, deliberate. I'm thinking about God in every action, thinking about God in every desire, in every pursuit, in all you do. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Lay everything on the altar. Consecrate everything to the Lord. Let nothing stand between you and God. Desire nothing beyond God. Ask for nothing beyond what God has provided. Pure heart, clean hands, yielded soul, yielded spirit. All surrender. All freely, fully give to Him. And your highest desire to be wholly prepared for heaven. And as you serve and work, for the Lord, the perfect Lord is always your point of reference. His grace, His willingness and ability to save, the conversion demanded by Him. That's what we are presenting to the people. And the life you live while you are working for God will be the life that is fully, completely yielded, surrendered unto Him. With no fear of man, A total, complete, perfect love for God, 
for believers, for your neighbors. Let the grace of God work in a definite way in your heart, in your life, that you'll know a definite change, transformation, a serpent. And you pray the Lord will make perfect, permanent, that relationship your heart with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for the exposition of your word. Thank you for your spirit taking the scripture and apply it to every heart and life. We pray, Lord, for everyone as we commit, consecrate our lives on your altar, asking that you'll do this important, indispensable work of grace to perfect our heart, our love for you. Lord, do it in every life, every heart, in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that it will be a definite experience of your grace. Not just a superficial thing that the heart remains superficial like ever before, but Lord, something so definite, your spirit will be a witness that this has been done in our hearts in Jesus' name. Perfect love. Perfect heart, perfect attitude, perfect disposition towards you and towards each other in Jesus' name. Help us not to carry just the righteousness of the Pharisees, of the religious people, but to carry and to have the very mind of Christ and to live it out everywhere we go in Jesus' name. Make us a blessing to everyone in the church and outside the church. And bless the work that we do for you to bring souls into the kingdom and to keep souls in the kingdom in Jesus' name. In our families, between husband and wife, between parents and children, and between the people and those who live with us, let there be peace. Perfect peace. Let the joy of the Lord be the strength of everyone in every family in Jesus' name. No diplomatic, psychological fighting no hatred one for another, but the love of Christ will flow from every heart to the believers and to the neighbors and to everyone around us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. We pray that the answer to the prayers we have prayed today will be seen, evident in all our communities in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 